Before we move on, let's just see how much you remember about sound and sound waves. So what is the property of sound waves that would make them be perceived as being louder um, by our ears, okay? Is it that they have a greater amplitude? Or is it that they have a longer wavelength or a shorter wavelength or a longer frequency? Look at your notes, give it some thought. Which one is it? It is if they have a greater wave amplitude. Amplitude is how big the waves are, not how frequently there is a wave, right? Now, when will sound waves have a higher pitch? Will they have a higher pitch if they have a greater wave amplitude? Well, no, because that's when they're louder, right? So we're talking about wavelength. So a longer wavelength and a longer frequency, those are the same things, basically. Um, shorter wavelength, yes. Shorter wavelength, that's when they will have a higher pitch. Longer wavelength, lower pitch. Longer frequency, basically same thing as a longer wavelength. All right, now, when you hear a louder sound, assuming you've got uh, hair cells that can experience that sound, then what will they do? Will they have larger action potentials? Will they have more frequent action potentials? Will they have longer action potentials? Or will they have wider action potentials? Look at your notes, give it some thought. What is the right answer? More frequent action potentials. Remember, action potentials are like a click on one of those clickers that you use to train animals, right? All the clicks are the same. The only choice you have is to do them more frequently. You can't make it louder or softer or higher or lower or, you know, yeah. Ready. And what is the function of the human ear? Ah, tricky. Make sure you read. By the way, all of the answers to my questions, don't stop when you think you've come to the right one. So does the human ear allow us, ear allow us to hear? Mm, I'm thinking yes. Does it give us our sense of balance? Yes. Now, not this part, right? But the ear, the whole ear, includes the inner ear. And the inner ear does have a part that allows us to experience balance and acceleration. The perception of sound. Hmm, let me think about that. Is it all the above or is it hearing and balance but not perception? I don't know if I made a big enough point of it, so I'll make it now. Perception is the province of the brain. Sensation, that is what our sensory receptors do. But perception means understanding what that sound means. So sound waves, lots of noise coming to my ear, might just be lots of noise coming to my ear and I can hear it and not perceive what it means. Perception would be, oh, that's the ice cream truck coming up the street. So one and two, but not three. Proprioceptors, I told you we were gonna talk about proprioceptors because proprioceptors, they are kind of conscious, but they're not one of these senses that we're talking about. You should know that they are mechanoreceptors. And if I close my eyes, and if you move my arm, I know that you moved my arm even though I didn't see it. If I close my eyes and my arms are just flopping about, I know where they are. Why? Proprioceptors. Proprioceptors are a type of mechanoreceptor that is found in our muscles and in our ligaments and in our tendons. And they're busy reporting to the brain how stretched different things are. Those are proprioceptors, okay? So proprioception allows me to close my eyes and touch my nose. How do I know where my hand is? Proprioceptors, and they're a type of mechanoreceptor. Now, let's move on to the chemoreceptor senses. Now we're going to, now we're, now we're going to talk about, well, I didn't do that well at all. Let's try again. Chemoreceptors, chemoreceptors. Chemoreceptors allow us to sense chemicals. That's why they're called chemoreceptors. And the chemicals that we can sense 
We sense either by smelling them or tasting them. The sense of taste is also known as gustatory. The sense of hearing is auditory, right? So chemoreceptors, let's talk about them. Taste is a chemoreceptor sense. Now, surprisingly, we cannot distinguish very many flavors by using our tongues. Our tongues have got a very limited ability to detect chemicals in our food. The chemoreceptor cells are grouped together in what are known as taste buds. Like that's a little taste bud, there's a little taste bud, there's a little, I really should use maybe blue. There's a taste bud, there's a taste bud, oh, over there, there's a taste bud. Those, those cells, when you look at them through the microscope, they do look like little flower buds that are ready to open. Now, the bumps you see on the back of your tongue, like, ah, you know, those bumps, technically not taste buds. Those are technically papillae. And you've got different kinds of papillae on your tongue. The ones that are most obvious on the back of your tongue are the, are the fungiform ones. Not a part, that's anatomy, not a part of our physiology class. What is a part of our physiology class is that these taste bud cells that are found, they are found down in little crevices here where liquid mixed with the chemicals that we can taste, that goes down in there. So when people have got, like let's imagine people have got a really dry mouth. If you've got a really dry mouth, it is very difficult for you to taste things appropriately because that dryness leaves dry mucus up here and so any water cannot go down into the little crevices where you will find the taste bud cells. So a dry mouth will suppress your ability to taste food. What else do we need to know about that? Flavors that don't go into a liquid form also do not get tasted very easily. No. Okay, so. There we go. Now, our tongue can only detect five different flavors. That always seemed really baffling to me because I was like, wait a minute, you know, my friend's lasagna tastes really different from my lasagna. They're both basically lasagna, but it's not my tongue that is telling me that difference. It's not, okay? Your tongue is not capable of distinguishing that many flavors. And you should write this down. Most of your experience of your food, most of it comes from your nose. I know it seems weird, right? But our sense of smell is more of our experience of flavor than what's going on in our tongue. What will our tongue be able to detect? only five different things, and we will talk about those. Uh, by the way, let's look at this image from you know, someone else's textbook. So a sugar, sugar actually binds to a little cell surface receptor there and will cause second messengers that if there are enough of those, it'll initiate a little action potential in that cell. And we've learned that action potentials in sensory receptor cells are called receptor potentials. Oh, great. So when you look at the tongue, those things are not taste buds. Those things you're looking at here, those are papillae. If you take papillae like that and you cut them up and then you look down in there with a microscope, you will see little groups of cells. All of these cells are sensory receptor cells that are chemoreceptor cells that stick their little noses out into that little crevice there to experience flavors. And right now, as far as we know, humans can only taste five different flavors. Yes, five different flavors. Lots of different scents, but only five different flavors. And they are sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Now, they are looking for more. They are looking for the ability to taste fat, 
They haven't found it yet, but they're looking for it. They are looking for the ability. I think they should look for the ability to taste metal because I think I can taste metal, but that's it. All right. So what are these flavors? Let me just erase the ink. What are the flavors? Sweet. Sweet is the taste of sugar. And mostly for humans, we really like the taste of glucose and sucrose. But our favorite flavor for sweetness is fructose, right? Now, when, when we make artificial sweeteners, we make chemicals that will bind to the same receptor that um, glucose or fructose or sucrose will bind to, but activate it extra and have no calories. So that's how artificial sweeteners work. You can think of them as being a sugar receptor agonist, if you wanted to, all right? Sour. There are lots of sour flavors in our foods. Uh, the sourness that comes from fruits, like are shown here, can be um, citric acid or ascorbic acid. Those are very common in our foods. Um, the sourness from vinegar is going to be uh, acetic acid. The sourness from like yogurt, that is going to be lactic acid. So those things are all sour flavors. By the way, we are able to experience a lot of acids as being sour. Even something that's toxic, like hydrochloric acid, would taste sour to us, but yeah, don't eat it. Okay, salt. You know, salt is interesting. We don't experience that many chemical salts as tasting like salt. So what humans taste as salt is mostly sodium chloride, which is the dominant uh, chemical in table salt. We taste that as salty. Potassium chloride, potassium chloride takes, tastes salty to us, but it doesn't taste quite right. So sometimes when people have, got them, have been diagnosed as having high blood pressure, they will go on a low salt diet and there's some salt you can buy in the grocery store that's called low sodium salt. And it's a mixture of these two. Okay, so that's salt. Then we have got bitter. Now, usually when you say the word bitter, people think, ooh, bitter, bitter is gross. But the truth is that adults actually like the taste of bitter quite a bit. Little kids don't. Little kids avoid anything that tastes like bitter, but, but adults like it. Um, and good examples of bitter flavors that adults like are coffee and dark chocolate. When you're a little kid, you don't like dark chocolate. As a matter of fact, when you're a little kid, you're not that wild about milk chocolate. You don't remember this, but your parents probably do. Um, the kind of chocolate that little young kids eat is like not hardly chocolate at all. And then as you get older, you start appreciating chocolate. Let's talk about coffee. The first coffee you ever drank when you were a little kid, it was a bunch of milk and sugar with a tiny bit of coffee added to it. By at this point in your life, you might actually like black coffee that has no milk or sugar added to it. Um, so uh, we actually come to appreciate the flavor of bitterness. We're born liking sugar. We're born liking salt. When you're young, there's almost nothing that is too sweet, but for your entire life, it is possible for things to be too salty when you're human, okay? And then there is umami. Umami sounds like I made it up. When your parents were in school, they might have not learned about umami, so they might think you're making it up too. But umami is a newer flavor. And umami uh, in Japanese means savory. And is, it is the quality of foods that are high in protein. Okay? Things that are high in protein have got high umami flavor. There's a chain of restaurants called Umami Burger. And Umami Burger um, 
accentuates the umami flavors of their hamburgers. So, you know, sometimes you'll just be craving a hamburger and someone can say, oh, here, I've got a bag of potato chips and you'll eat the potato chips and you're like, no, I still want a burger, right? It's because you're craving that umami flavor. Umami, and you should write this down, is the flavor of glutamate and also some nucleotides. Remember nucleotides are the building blocks of nucleic acids. So any kind of substance that's got lots of nucleotides, I mean, let's just focus on glutamate. Lots of glutamate will have an umami flavor. And that is why people add MSG to food. Um, MSG stands for monosodium glutamate. And when I was your age, everyone knew that MSG gave people headaches. And you know what? It turns out that that is not true. It was it, Honestly, it was just like two months ago, I was reading something and I was like, remember when people thought MSG called, caused headaches? And I was like, yes. And then I was reading the study and you know, they've just proven it. But if you go into most Chinese restaurants, something like no MSG added will be on the menu. Some people do have a very adverse reaction to MSG. I'm not saying it's safe for everyone, but it is safe for most people. And if you look at any can of soup, most cans of soup have MSG added because it's delicious, because it's got glutamate MSG, right? So what does it mean that butterflies taste with their feet? It means that they've got little areas that have got chemoreceptor cells in them so that when they put their feet into a flower to taste the nectar, they can go, ooh, yummy deliciousness with their foot. All right, we will start here at the next video.